Hey everybody, I'm, uh, I'm Justin Ha. And I'm Greg Dock. So I uh, hope you guys had a good lunch and you're ready for uh, something cool. So we're, we're here today to talk about App Engine backends. Um, so I'm a, I'm a software engineer on the App Engine systems infrastructure team. And I'm also a software engineer, but I work on the task queue infrastructure. <clears throat> so this, uh, there's a few links on this page, uh, if you guys are following along, uh, a link to the, the session. And you can go to speaker meter uh, to rate our performance. OK, so we're here today to talk about App Engine backends. Um, we'll start off with a little bit of a, a brief description of, of how we do things on App Engine, why we do what that means. Uh, and then we'll talk about backends and what they're offering. Uh, go through a Hello World example, some configuration, and then we'll have a, a brief demo. Uh, we'll wrap up with some best practices, caveats on the future. OK, so I just want to talk just for a second about the App Engine way of doing things. If you go back to the original blog post for App Engine, the goal of App Engine is to make it easy to get started with a new web app and then make it easy to scale that app when it, goes to, when it uh, reaches the point where it's receiving significant traffic and has millions of users. So App Engine is supposed to, it, it, the goal of App Engine is to, have, to, to, to provide a very high performance web application infrastructure uh, for your applications. And what that means is it should be very easy to deploy new apps. Uh, it scales dynamically for you. You have a, a, a really high performance scalable storage layer, a uh, rich set of APIs, and what App Engine, the way App Engine, the whole philosophy behind App Engine is about breaking things, breaking very large problems like serving thousands of queries a second into very small pieces and, and performing them in parallel, uh, being fault tolerant, horizontal scaling. So this is, this is the philosophy behind how App Engine works, and you guys are probably very familiar with that. <clears throat> but there's a few things about this philosophy. Not everything is a web app. Um, maybe you just want to run a command on the server and uh, gener generate a report. Um, what if you want to just have a, a single global counter or a set of global counters that are uh, tracking data in aggregate for your application? These things are a little hard to do. Uh, you might have to shard your counter and have m relatively complex uh, operations to try to, to try to compute a total. The instances are very lightweight. <clears throat> they have relatively low memory, limited amounts of CPU, and they're anonymous. They're not addressable. So you can't guarantee that you're going back to the same instance on a second request. There's 30-second deadlines, which I'm guessing you guys are familiar with. And, and, they're, and, and again, they're, not, they're anonymous. So there's, there's a lot of restrictions that App Engine puts in place in order to guide you to making a very highly scalable application. Break things into small pieces, 30-second requests, a lot of different, a lot of small instances that, that grow and shrink in response to traffic. Well, today we're announcing something called backends, which changes how things work on App Engine. This is the full public release as of this morning of App Engine backends. Uh, we posted it on the blog this morning, and this talk will be about how backends work and what they do for you. They're a powerful new way to write programs on App Engine. They let you do things that were not possible before. And they make App, App Engine much more of a complete general purpose computing platform. So what are backends? <clears throat> backends are App Engine instances with some unique features. They can run for long periods of time. They're high performance. They're configurable. Each backend is addressable. They're persistent in memory over long periods of time. These are high performance cloud processes running on App Engine. They're powerful building blocks for application and can be combined in, to make uh, really interesting high performance distributed uh, applications. They're very easy to use and they're very flexible. So what are, what are the features? Well, an App Engine backend can be configured with anywhere from 128 megs up to a gigabyte of RAM. They can use up to 4.8 gigahertz of CPU. There's no request deadlines to backends. They can run indefinitely. They can be addressed individually. 
They can be configured to be resonant in memory over, for, for long periods or dynamic in response to traffic. And they automatically restart if they ever go down. And they're very app engine -y. They're easy to configure. You can deploy them very quickly. Um, you get all the nice graphs and consoles and charts that you're used to having with App Engine. And there's dev app server support for backends. So what does this mean? App Engine, again, it's, a, it's now much more of a general purpose cloud computing platform. It's suitable for high performance servers. You can do a large amounts of in-memory caching, uh, self-driven programs that start and just run continuously, uh, tiered architectures, and heavyweight offline processing. And at this point, App Engine is really suitable for a lot more than just websites. So what are use cases for, app, for, uh, for backends? Uh, anything memory intensive is a good fit. So if you have a, a web search index that you want to keep in memory, or really any type of search index, uh, if you want to have a giant social graph that you keep in memory, uh, if you're running a game server, if you want to do your own custom memcache with your own hash function and sharding, uh, if you want to do something that uses a lot of CPU, image manipulation, audio, video encoding, um, if you're doing some scientific computing app engine, now could be a better fit for that. Or, of course, uh, meme generation could, could be definitely a use case. Uh, so background processing. Um, if you have a data pipeline that's taking, uh, taking data, performing several transforms, uh, something that runs continuously, that, that's a good fit. Uh, a web crawler. Task execution, you can now handle tasks. You can direct tasks at a backend, and they can just run with, without a deadline, basically. Um, it's, it's actually 24 hours, but that's a little bit of an improvement. Uh, commands and scripts, you can uh, issue a command yourself to a dynamic backend. It starts up. It can just run until the script is done. Uh, you can have ad hoc queries. You can have backends to generate load for your application. And if you were at the last talk, you know how important that is for building a scalable app or report generation. So let's see Hello World. OK, this is an app.yaml. Looks pretty simple, pretty familiar. So what we add here is a backends.yaml file. And we're going to create one backend named hello. And we'll make it public so that we can access it. And it's available at hello.backends.io.appspot.com. So you'll notice that we're addressing this backend by adding the backend name as a prefix to the URL. So traffic without this prefix is directed at the backend's I.O. Uh, dynamic application version with the prefixes directed at the backend. And you can add instances. So here's 15 instances. Each one has an address. And they reliably, can reliably contact each instance by appending the instance index to the URL. Uh, Hello.py. Um, pretty simple, right? And we have added this new backend's API. With methods like get the backend name, you can get the instance index of the backend that you're working with. Um, there's, there's functions for computing the URL of a backend or other backends uh, and the host name. So commands for working with backends. These are new as of 150. Uh, fairly familiar, uh, backends update works a lot like app CFG update does currently. Uh, you configure your backend, you run app CFG update, and now you have a backend that's running uh, in Google's Google's Cloud. Uh, list, start, stop, delete. We'll get into more of what those do. So here's an example of what this looks like. Pretty, si pretty similar to what you guys are used to. If you do a list, this is what you'll get back. Uh, you're getting back the backend config that the server has. And it, you'll notice that the state is start. So with backends, you can start and stop them yourself. And you can decide whether they're serving traffic uh, or not. And app CFG backend stop will stop the, stop the server. And you can see if you do a list that it's stopped. And again, if you, you can start and stop them. OK, so let's dive into some configuration. What can you do here? So the backends.yaml file, it lists each backend. You can define up to five. Uh, the app.yaml is the same as it is before, except the version is now optional, because you may have just an app that only has backends. So you can just configure it that way. Uh, the handlers that you are normally used to working with are still defined in app.yaml, and they're shared by the app and, the, and any backends that you have defined. Uh, the code is also shared. And you update each one individually. So here's what a more flushed out backends.yaml file will look like. And I'll go into some of these settings in just a second. 
Um, but here's a crawler. Uh, we defined a start script where the crawler runs main.py when it starts up. Uh, here's a search backend. It's, it's configured as a B8, uh, which has uh, high memory and CPU limits, five instances of this, uh, and a worker. Uh, and here we've made this worker dynamic so that it doesn't always stay up and stay in memory. It only uh, comes up in response to traffic or a command that the worker has to, has to execute. So you can see how we've added a number of different server processes, uh, each of which can be configured with multiple instances uh, to your application. So now we essentially have almost four different things going on in this application, the normal application version and each of these three backends. So things you can add in backends.yaml. Uh, the name is used in commands to identify the backend. It's using URLs. Uh, you can target a backend using the, uh, with, with a task or with a cron job by adding the target parameter. Uh, in syntax, so the name is used, used there. The name is global and it's shared across uh, the version space, namespace for your application. Um, and backends currently are not versioned. And it's using the backends API. So instances control the number of instances for your backend. Uh, there, are, there are two ways that the instances count works. If you have a resonant backend, which is the default, you always will have exactly that many instances, and when you start the backend, all of them come up at the same time. With a dynamic backend, uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, not, the instances do not come up immediately. They wait until traffic arrives and are, and are brought up and taken down as you're used to with a normal application version on App Engine. And, they're used, and the instances are used in a URL like so, like I showed before. You can only have 20 instances currently per backend. The class specifies the performance and price characteristics of the backend. So we're going out today with four classes, B1, B2, B4, and B8. And you can see the, uh, the limits, the memory and CPU limits, and the prices. And so the price includes the memory and the CPU used by the instance. And they're priced by the hour, or by the minute, actually. So we're tr tracking exactly the uptime of, your back, of each backend instance, and your build according to this hourly rate uh, just just, just uh, according to how much your backends are up. There's an additional 15 minute charge associated with, with starting up a backend instance. So once someone's up, you should, you should try to uh, keep it up. Uh, we don't want people creating and, and bringing down backend instances very, very rapidly. And you can adjust the class over time if you want more memory or CPU. The start directive configures a script to handle the AH start request, which is a special request that App Engine will send each backend instance to start it up. And the start directive allows you to configure a separate handler for this, uh, for each backend. And this is only in Python right now. We're working on uh, uh, something similar in Java. Uh, but there's two uses for the start request. Uh, to initialize state for a backend that's coming up that's going to then process user requests, or to just take that start request and just continue to run. Uh, like if you're a web crawler or if you're doing a load test or something like that. And during the startup period, other requests will wait until the start finishes, at which point App Engine considers the backend to have become initialized and ready to serve traffic. Uh, and success is basically a 200 response code. We also consider 404 a success. A failed start causes the instance to be restarted. So if you're working with backends and you're having trouble seeing them come up, go check the logs. It's usually because the start request has failed. So options. These are a set of Boolean flags that configure how the backend works. So public allows it to accept external HTTP requests. By default, they're private. Uh, and that means that they accept requests from either an admin of the application or from uh, another instance of the application or the task queue or cron, uh, something internal to App Engine. Uh, Dynamic. So this switches the mode from resonant to dynamic, which causes the backends to only come up if they are receiving traffic. And there is some scalability here up to the 20 uh, instance limit that I mentioned before. So AppEng will only create instances up to that 20 according to traffic. And they're shut down when they're idle. So dynamic is really a way to, to give AppEngine more automatic control of your backend instances, which can save you money because they'll be turned down kind of immediately, once, relatively immediately after, they're, after they become idle. Um, fail fast is a, another option which disables the pending queue for your backend instance, which uh, is useful for working with clients that are more sophisticated that want a very quick response to just know whether uh, a request can be handled or, or, or should it be retried or, or potentially tried later. Okay.
let's see a demo. Uh, Greg is here and will be showing you some backends. Okay. So I think I'll first start off with a generic counting service. And so currently people use memcache to get this particular feature. But the problem with memcache is that you don't know how long the data is actually going to last for, uh, as it's quite transient. So with backends, you get full control of this, and you're able to have your own hashing algorithm, so you can shard it across any backend you want. You can control how long the data is there for and how much you want to store. And in this particular example, this is actually going to use data store to do this persistently. So if you want to click on the link down the bottom, it will show you an example of this page. And as you can see, it says, welcome visitor number two, because this is the second person who's visited the page. So what I'll do is I'll quickly go over the front end that I just demoed to you. Uh, as you can see, uh, we use the new backends API to use the get URL call to get the URL for the counters backend. We then use that URL and the form encoding mechanism to send the payload with the name of visitor, a delta of one. And we send that to the backend. And then the content that we get back from that backend, we just display straight to the user. So while I'm doing this, I'll just start off a load test. And I'm currently doing that with a backend. And this is a resident backend. It has 10 instances. I'll just start that now. And I'll actually go over that code. So this particular example, uh, we use the same method, the get URL, to get where we're going to send the request to. And we have uh, 10 different counters. And as you see, this is something that you don't normally see in App Engine. You have a while true loop, and that's it. So we pick a random counter, we send that request through with URL fetch, and then we just ignore the result and go back through in the loop. So now onto the actual other backend, the counter backend. Uh, so we have a fairly simple model here. Uh, there's only a single value stored, and that is value, and that's the, written to data store. We also have this dirty flag, and I'll get into that a bit more later, but that's not written to data store. So with the counting store, it's quite simple. Uh, we get the name in from the request, and we check if the uh, model ex exists in our cache, and if not, we load it from data store. Uh, once we've loaded it, we then return it back to the user if they did a, a get request. If it was a, an increase request, what we do is we increase it by the amount and we set the dirty flag to be true. You'll notice the shutdown flag here. What this is there for is that uh, your application may get a shutdown request at any time. And so we, mark, we set the shutdown flag just after we've written everything to disk. I'll get that to, to that in a second. And this is the, the shutdown that I was actually talking about. So, what we do is, in the event of this uh, backend being shut down, we write everything to disk, we set the shutdown flag to true, and then that will ensure that everything is persisted to disk correctly. The way how we actually set the shutdown hook is in the startup handler, which is the first request that goes to this instance, we, set, we use the set shutdown hook command. So I'll go back to the example load test that I started up before. If you have a look at the instances console, you'll see that this particular instance has been doing about 120 uh, requests per second. That's quite good. So we'll stop the load test, and we'll have a look at data store. So if I do a query on data store, you'll see that it's empty, so that there's actually nothing in data store. But if I go back to the instances console and press the shutdown button, you'll see that a shutdown request has been sent. If we go back to the data store viewer and run this query, you'll see that all the counters have actually been updated. This is just a simple example of doing a counter. This particular example could be easily be moved to memcache, but there are many more advanced things that you can actually do. And the code for this example is up on backends-io.appswap.com. And I'll pass it back to Justin for more information about backends. All right. Thanks, Greg. So let's talk about using backends and some best practices. So we'll cover resident, using resident backends versus dynamic. We'll cover scaling, startup and shutdown, uh, how logging works with backend and backends under long, uh, during long running requests, uh, a little bit more about fail fast, um, some ideas about message passing between front ends and back ends and, and instances, uh, how task queues work, and uh, handlers. So, a lot to get through. Okay, resident backends. So, a resident backend, as I mentioned before, they are always on. So, they are always up uh, once you start the backend. Uh, 
automatically will be restarted if, if anything happens to cause a shutdown. So if you go to that instances console that Greg showed and hit shutdown, uh, they'll come right back up. Um, if, they get, if there's a uh, app engine maintenance and we're potentially moving from one data center to another, uh, they'll, bring, they'll be immediately brought up in the new data center. Um, if there's any other issues that may occur, uh, they come right back. Um, resident instances also just can run forever. So you can take the start request and just run. And uh, because they're restarted, you can, be, you can reliably know that this backend will be taking start and just kind of running continuously. So these are really great for like background, continuous background processing uh, applications. Um, explicit start and stop, like I mentioned before. So they're going to, they're going to stay up in, in resident memory until you, until you stop them yourself. So uses for this, again, continuous ex execution. Uh, pull queues is a great example where you have a backend that comes up and it chooses to pull, uh, pull requests from a pull queue and process, pro uh, process tasks in, in batch. Uh, that can be a lot more efficient than using push queues. Um, these are great for large addressable amounts of memory. So let's say you have, um, I don't know, let's say you have a lot of data in the data store, you want to load it all up into memory and then access it at memory speed. So like sub millisecond or on the order of, you know, just very, very quickly uh, perform any sort of computation you want over that, over that data, you can have that in a backend. Um, and you can split it up across backends so that you can address, uh, like say you could shard users so that users are uh, split across the backends and you can know, uh, hash the username and go contact the backend that, you, that has that user's data. Um, and it could be flushed at, at shutdown time or periodically uh, like Greg showed. Um, or you can write your own custom, custom memcache using backends. Uh, so the pattern here is at start time, load up some state, then handle requests, or just handle, do start and uh, run continuously. So dynamic backends are similar to existing instances on App Engine, except that you can figure the amount of memory and CPU they have access to, and there's a limit of 20 of them. So these only come up when, they, when they're sent a request. At that point, App Engine will kind of hold the user's request and issue the start to bring up, that, bring up the backend. And once the backend is up, it will handle the user request. So with these, you really want to minimize the amount of time, uh, amount of state you're initializing at startup or perform some kind of, your, some kind of routing on your own or some sort of like uh, warm-up requests on your own to get the dynamic instances up before you flip traffic over if you're worried about uh, if you want to do a lot of state initialization. So here, you pay for what you use. Uh, if uh, you do this on with resident as well, but with dynamic backends, they'll be turned down if, if there's not traffic for a few minutes. Uh, and there's no management of start and stop, so you can configure a backend to be dynamic and really not, not have to worry about doing too much management with that, uh, with that backend. Uh, the, the, counter, the counter server that Greg mentioned would be actually, a, would, would, would function as a dynamic backend as well, because if it was integrated with your application, if it was getting traffic, it would, it would be in memory, it'd be working uh, as traffic fell off, it'd be shut down, it'd flush its state, and, um, and you wouldn't be paying for it. Um, so the pattern here, you know, load up a little bit of state, handle requests, and then write out state, either intermediately or uh, during shutdown. So scaling. Uh, I just gave a talk on scaling. <laughs> uh, Backends don't scale the same way that normal application instances do on App Engine. Um, they're designed to work either online or offline, but they really, really shine when it comes to offline work because you're controlling the number of instances, you're controlling the amount of throughput that your offline processing is handling. Um, if you hit limits, you know, if, if, you're, if you're maxing out the memory and CPU of your backends, you're just gonna have, a, your processing is gonna slow down a little bit. But nothing that bad happens. And if you want to resize, you can, you can pause the offline execution, resize it, and bring it right back up. No big deal. Uh, when you integrate a backend into an online web flow, you're usually not in control of the traffic that's coming at that, at that, uh, at that backend, um, unless you, you know, are rerouting traffic between different versions of your application or your different, different, different backends. Um, if you hit limits in, in a web flow, if you, if you scale up to all 20 backends uh, and they're running out of kind of CPU, if they're maxing out their CPU, you know, it's, it could be a problem for your, for your application. So we urge caution when int introducing backends into an online flow. We'd like for you to carefully consider and monitor the resource usage and probably over-provision. Um, or if you're using dynamic backends, um, just be, again, be careful about the resource usage because there is that 20 instance limit. Um, App Engine will scale you up to that 20, but th there is that fixed limit currently. 
Um, so look at the Instances console. We're also providing a new runtime API, which exposes the CPU and memory usage of in each instance. And using this, you can uh, dynamically see how your, how your instances are performing. So strategies for dealing with uh, situations where you're kind of hitting, hitting the limits of your backends. The default is to just take a little bit of downtime. You do an update, add some more instances. Um, there's a brief window when you're doing an update where the old instances of your, of your backend are taken down and the new ones are brought up. So if you minimize the shutdown time and you minimize that start time, that can be a very, that can be a very uh, short window and you won't really see a whole lot of, of downtime. Um, a better option probably would be to do some routing yourself where you have two backends, uh, A and B or one and two, uh, bring up the second one, flip the traffic over, take down the first one. And this is useful for doing canaries of new code or doing a little bit of, of staging. The best option is probably, again, to use options dynamic where App Engine will scale you up to those 20 instances. Um, you could do custom routing logic yourself where you have uh, more instances configured than you're actually using uh, typically and proxy requests through some of your own application logic. If you don't target a request at a backend instance, uh, it won't actually come up. So you could choose to only load balance across some fraction of the configured instances, like five or 10 out of 20, uh, and, and kind of just on the fly using some configuration command uh, uh, or, or, or an admin request uh, to change that. OK, so let's move on to startup. I mentioned before that this AH start request is a special request that App Engine will send to bring up your backend instances. Um, this is sent for resonant backends as soon as you hit the start, as, as soon as you start the, the backend. Um, when you, with a dynamic uh, backend, again, it only comes when, it only arrives when a user request arrives. And it allows you to then run indefinitely. Uh, and I think I've pretty much covered this then. So shutdown. There's two types of shutdown, polite and hard shutdown. So polite, with polite shutdown, we get, we give your backend instance 30 seconds of notice before it's terminated. Um, this allows you to do some checkpointing of state. Um, and this, uh, this so, so some examples of, of when polite shutdown occurs are when machines go undergo maintenance, when App Engine undergoes maintenance, uh, if there's a scheduling change and, and we have to move your backend instance to a different machine. Uh, those are all examples of polite shutdown. So most of the time we expect to be able to provide polite shutdown notice for your backend instances. Uh, hard shutdown is when we don't have that opportunity. Uh, when a machine dies, this can happen. Uh, if there's some sort of hardware failure, uh, if you've exceeded your memory limits, if there's some problems with uh, ne the network to a data center, um, that, that, can, that can be in a case where we have a hard shutdown. So when this occurs, this, this occurs there's, there's not a lot of time, really is no time to write out any state. So uh, a best practice then is to don't, don't you use the backend as a cache of, of data that's, that's persistent um, or be okay with a little bit of loss. And you really need to figure out how to, uh, how to handle shutdowns. So, uh, <laughs> so the runtime API uh, is what we've provided. There's uh, two methods of handling shutdown. The first method is to pull the, the, sh the is shutting down method. This will, this will flip to true when you uh, are being shut down, and you'll have 30 seconds of notice to, to do whatever you'd like. So in this example, uh, we have a backend that's looping, it's doing work uh, for 10 seconds each time. Uh, then it will check the shutting down, and if so, it'll checkpoint and, and break out of the loop. The other way is the shutdown callback that Greg mentioned. So you define the callback, the checkpoint callback, and just shut the shutdown hook when you start up, and you can just work continuously. So this is, this is a little bit easier. OK, so the way logging works with backends, so these requests can take a long time. Normally, logs are only written out to the admin console at the end of a request. But with backends, uh, we automatically flush logs. And there's this uh, log service API that we've introduced that has constants you can tune to decide how, how often the auto flush works. Uh, every, every so many bytes of, of log messages, every so many log lines uh, or seconds. And you can manually flush, uh, flush whenever you'd like. OK, so fail fast. This is for sophisticated clients that 
want to know immediately when a request can't be handled, and they have some sort of alternative strategy. They want to. They have their own ability to to to, ha to have a queue uh, of requests, things that they need done. External queuing systems are an example of this. They want to perform their own retries, or they have some sort of fallback fallback uh, behavior. So if you configure your backend with options fail fast, it, all requests to that backend will will get fail fast behavior. On the client side, you can set this with uh, a new header called X app engine fail fast, and that causes that particular request to be to have fail fast behavior. So client or server side. Okay, message passing. Um, with backends, you can have requests that are running for long periods of time. So it's not always possible to send a backend a request if it's a single threaded back, uh, single threaded instance. Uh, you can't really send it another request until the first one is, fin is finished. And if it's running for a long time, that can be a little problematic. So um, Earl fetch, you know, of course, is, is kind of the typical way you'd exchange information between the instances. They could just fetch each other. Um, but when you have this long-running request, you probably want to use something like memcache or data store, where you have a reader and a writer. So the writer's writing entities. They're probably annotated with the backend instance name uh, or instance ID. Uh, and the, the backend is then reading and periodically pulling to, to see if there's a message, if there's something for it to do. Uh, you can also use task queues for this. It's really convenient. If you want to send something out of, uh, send a, a message to a backend, you just insert, you just add the target, and uh, that task will be directed at a backend. Or if you use pull queues, each backend could have its own queue that's just periodically pulling, uh, pulling tasks from. And if someone wants to send it a message, you can just put something in the pull queue. And uh, so that brings us to task queues. So I think I've pretty much covered this. Uh, there's the target directive in queues.yaml. There's the target parameter to task queue.add. That's how you target a backend. And, and with pull queues, you can um, decide how many tasks you want to, to lease. You lease them for a, a brief period uh, and then complete them. There's a talk coming up right after this called Putting Task Queues to Work, which will go into a lot more detail about how pull queues work and the differences between push and pull queues uh, when you might want to use the different, the different options. So the last best practice I'll talk about is code and handlers. So with this release, all the handlers for your application in Python are specified in app.yaml. For Java, they're expressed in WebXML, the servlets. Um, we don't currently have a mechanism for you to specify a different set of handlers for backends. So if you have a set of URLs that you only want to express or expose in a backend, uh, we advise you to mark them with login admin. Um, if other instances of your applica application access those URLs, uh, they'll be able to do this seamlessly without any additional configuration. Um, but they'll be protected from, from open requests on the web. Um, another strategy would be to have two directories, uh, an app directory and then a directory where you have your backends. Uh, the app.yaml in the, and, and the main app pretty much stays the same. But then in the backends directory, uh, the app.yaml will have the handlers for just the backends. And you don't have to go through this, this work of adding logmin admin because you don't have to worry about those handlers being exposed in the main application. Or you could have a directory for each backend. Um, and you kind of get the idea there. Uh, if you have, if, if uh, you're downloading some third party uh, backend that someone else has written, you want to integrate it into your application, you can just have a directory for that. Ha in the app.yaml, uh, just don't have the version, don't have a version of your application. Uh, the handlers there will be the handlers for the backend. And when you do an update, it will only update that backend. And if a backend is missing in a backends.yaml, um, it's not deleted, it's, so it's, it's sort of additive. Uh, when you do an update, it will only update the backends listed in backends.yaml. OK. So we've heard a lot about backends, a lot of great things, but uh, some caveats. OK, so currently, you can only configure five backends for your application. You can have up to 10 gigabytes total across all the different backends, uh, adding up all the instances of each backend. A backend can have 20 instances. Um, and here's some combinations of how you can arrive at 10 gigabytes. Uh, you can either have 10 B8s, each of which is a gig, uh, 20 B4s, which are half a gig each, and you can, you can get the idea. So all the normal API deadlines still apply. So URL fetch deadlines still apply. The data store has a 30-second deadline uh, for requests. Um, size limits apply. So with HTTP requests to a backend, um, you can have 32 megabyte 
requests, but the total, um, the, 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 the total size of all requests to your back, in, your back in instance uh, is, is also limited. So if you're using very large requests, um, you need to sort of serialize them a little bit. Uh, Earl fetch, memcache, blob store, mail, tasks. So all of these normal limits are still in place. What we've done is just swapped out the instance that's performing these API calls. Also, there's not an uptime guarantee for backends right now. Uh, this is a best effort service. Um, you should expect shutdown. You should expect polite shutdown most of the time. Uh, you should write your application in a way that tolerates hard, hard shutdown. And there's various causes, like I've mentioned, software bugs, hardware failures, emergencies. I would strongly recommend you guys check out the talk called Life in App Engine Production, which is tomorrow. Uh, Michael Handler and uh, Alan Green are giving this talk. It's a great talk. Definitely check it out. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in production. So the future. There's a lot of things that we are releasing today with backends, but there's a lot more we can do. Uh, better scaling. So you've, you've seen how uh, backends can scale up to 20 instances. Um, we're looking into ways of, of introducing auto-scaling, the same auto-scaling behavior we have for front-end versions, uh, uh, which uh, is another term we sometimes use when referring to the main app version, um, uh, introducing that for backends as well. We're considering a scaling API to give you a little more control where you can dynamically increase the number of instances of your backend at any time. Uh, better updates so that you don't have a period of downtime when you're performing an update, so each instance kind of is updated in, se in sequence. Or you have online updates where if you just want to change the number of instances, you don't have to take down the existing ones. You can uh, just change that number, and the new ones will come up. Uh, we, we're looking into better concurrency. Uh, so background threads in Java, Python concurrency, uh, so that a single Python backend instance can essentially handle more than one request at a time. We're looking into ways of doing that and better configuration, where, which solves some of the problems around having handlers uh, be the same for both backends and, and, and the application version. And also versioning for backends is, is on our radar. Uh, better uptime. Um, backend uptime uh, is, is pretty good, uh, but uh, minimizing restarts and keeping them up as long as possible is, is something we're going to continue to work on. And we'll have some statistics over time to share with you about that. Uh, there'll be API integrations, more of them. Uh, I'd recommend you guys check out the MapReduce talk. Uh, there will be ways to uh, configure backends to be MapReduce workers, or to send mail at a backend, or have a backend share a channel that a front-end instance created. Also looking at, uh, at more power, so new instance classes over time, uh, longer, longer deadlines, larger API calls. These are things that the serving infrastructure team is always uh, thinking about, and potentially streamed responses and, and sockets. So just to recap, um, I think you can say that backends really sort of redefine what App Engine is. Um, it's not just for 30-second requests. It's not just for uh, lightweight web, web serving. It's really for uh, heavyweight processing, offline processing, large in-memory indexes. Um, we're giving you a lot of memory and CPU to work with. Uh, backends are a building block that you guys can use to build a lot of really cool stuff. So, uh, and, and, and lastly, just they're, they're both very easy to configure. They, they have all the production support, deployment, and ease of use that you're used to with, applica with, uh, with App Engine. And they're managed by our Google production, a team of uh, production, crack production engineers who are amazing at solving problems that you guys uh, don't even have to know about. And that's it. So thank you for coming. And if you guys have any questions, please uh, come up to the mics. And we'll have some time for questions. Hi. Um, could you uh, share some best practices for coping with hard shutdowns? So the best practice is to expect hard shutdown. and. Uh, it use, use the memory of your backend as primarily a cache. If you are worried about, if, if you're tolerant of small amounts of data loss, or if the state is being regenerated from the data store or can be regenerated from the data store, that's, that's really the ideal. Um, that's, what I, that's what I'd say there. 
And I'd also suggest you look at the actual example code that is for that counters demo. Uh, it, that example also uses the task queue to flush the state back out to data store about every two seconds. And you can make it go faster if you wanted. When you said uh, extended API deadlines, are you talking about URL fetch as one example? Um, yeah, that's one example. Oh, that have, have been written right now? Um, I don't think I can really mention anything at the moment that's, that's using backends. Um, we have plans to use backends for some App Engine um, services in the future, um, but they're not, nothing ready to announce. All right. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and enjoy using App Engine backends.